Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind Pump. In honor of the opening of the NBA season, we have one of the top strength and conditioning NBA coaches on our show, Corey Schlesinger. Now he's gonna talk about some secrets for performance for both elite athletes and for the average person. He also talks about a concept called microdosing. No, that has nothing to do with psychedelics. It's about a way of training that maybe you can even apply to your own training to get good results. Now you can find Corey on his own Instagram at slash strength. Also, don't forget we have short clips over at our other YouTube channel, Mind Pump Clips. Go over there and subscribe and enjoy the show. Off air, we were talking about how competitive, and I told you, Mike, I had a high school girlfriend who went to college, ended up getting her degree in, I think, rec administration, ended up working for the Staples Center, hanging out with Kobe, Shaq, and all this. And me, like being in my early 20s, just dreaming of something like that. And she told me, no, it's not what it, all it's cracked up to be. It's like literally, it's hard. It's a lot of because it's so competitive. Is it's like, is it at all times, are there people? eyeing for your job that are willing to come do it is that oh it's absolutely like? i mean I, I think there's people that would do it for free if they could you yeah. know so then i gotta create a value system that goes well no Corey's Corey's services are worth this <laughs> so we need to we need to do this for him <laughs> uh but that's the idea is i'm telling you like it's it's really competitive it's so cutthroat and that's where i think you see it a lot in industries where there's like this safeguard or there's this very uh, conservative approach to how you do your job to maintain your job Oh, interesting. Uh, and that's where it's like, you don't see a lot of people step outside the box or outside tradition because, mm. you know, if you if you stick out like a nail, you're going to get hammered yeah. at some point, you know? Mm. So that's where, you know, like you can be a trendsetter, but it's dangerous. I think it can be very dangerous. Is now, there, is there mm. because it's so competitive, is, is there a, like, because I know in other organizations, maybe smaller organizations where, you know, coaches, strength coaches in particular, we're all in the strength space, I guess, or fitness space. Lots of cross communication. This works. This doesn't work. I tried this new technique. Did you have you apply this? But at your level, so competitive, or is it more secretive? Like I'll keep my tools to myself, and you do your own thing, and let's see what happens. That's a great question. I look at it like this: everything works. It really does. <laughs> it's just progressive overload, right? But it's so contextual in the person that you're working with and the environment that you're in. And I think that's where everybody starts losing their mind, right? They they try to develop these camps and it's like, this way is the right way to do it. And then you can always fall back on that type of, uh, that type of philosophy. But in reality, it's like, my philosophy is so flexible and pliable because of the athletes that walk into my room and their past. Like you gotta remember, I, I deal with athletes, it could be there for three months or they could be there for five years. So I gotta know their training history mm -hmm. and what they're comfortable doing. And really it's like neck up. Oh, you're confident with, you know, a, a sumo squat or a sumo deadlift. And I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to get somebody to progress on a sumo deadlift. But if that's what you've been doing and that works for you, absolutely. So that's where oh, I don't think you can just lock yourself into like this philosophy to have that secret. Like, oh, this is only what sure, we yeah. do. And that's the reason why it's like, Every, like I always go, I don't care about sharing what I do. It's because of how I apply it and in the context. That's the real secret. That's the secret. Would you say that's yeah. something that separates you from a lot of the other, of your peers, or do you think that most of them think the same way? Yeah, I think they think the same thing. It's just I, I'm just willing to share more, you know, and I think that maybe that's it. Because before that, I mean, you you just looked at it. I think a lot of strength coaches out there um, would look at a system as like this is how we're actually like basically like you're the coach of the team, like you're creating the system. Everybody has to do it this way in particular. And so then that kind of mentality went into the, the strength training program. So it was almost like the community workout as opposed to the individual focus. Would Facts. you say that's like a different? So it'd be, like, think about where strength and conditioning came from, like, especially in team sport it came traditionally through football, right? But those are the masses. Like that's a lot of roster spots. But when you start trickling down to more like smaller team rosters, like 10 to 15, well, you can get a lot more individualized. And I'm not saying you can't do individualization with large numbers. You definitely can. But when I look at it from the basketball's perspective, I mean, look at these dudes. Like They're huge. Yeah. And they have different biomechanics. They have different structure types. They have different strategies on how they create their force. Yeah, you, you, you can get into the weeds on that stuff. All right, today's giveaway again, because it's launch season for MAPS 15 Minutes. It's MAPS 15 Minutes. You can get it for free. This is the everyday workout program, which includes an advanced 
version. For those of you that like to work out with barbells and dumbbells, you've been working out for a while, you work out every day for 20 to 25 minutes, check it out. Get it for free. Here's how. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Click on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you only in the comment section that you want free access to Math 15 Minutes. Now, everybody else, because it's a brand new launch, if you sign up, you get it for $20 off. So the price is $77. Plus, you get two free ebooks included with this, plus the bonus advanced version. If you're interested, go to maps15minutes.com and then use the code 15 special for the discount and the free giveaways. All right, here comes the show. You know, it's interesting. I remember having a conversation with um, a, a, another strength and conditioning um, specialist, and I said something like, and as a trainer working with everyday average people, you know, we focus a lot on correctional exercise and, oh, their movement patterns need to be, you know, move this way instead of that way or whatever. And he said, yeah, at this level, you don't do that. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, they've been playing for so long with whatever patterns they have. If I go and try to change those, they're not going to play nearly as well. I could not agree more with that statement. The only thing I would change is if they have, they're symptomatic or they have an injury history. Right. Maybe they're manifesting that in a way that's not working out for them. But other than that, when... That's the best part about being in professional sports and watching these games night in and night out is you see the best athletes in the world just playing a sport. Like they're still the best athletes in the world. They're just playing a sport. So when you watch them, like their strategies on how they do what they do, you see like such individualization. And when you see those kind of movement strategies, even though everyone's doing a Euro step, how they do that Euro step, when you watch it in real time, you're like, Oh, back squats don't help everybody. <laughs> you know, you can't generalize exercise anymore. Yeah, how do you? Okay, so this has got to be such a a hard decision for you, or a very technical thing to probably to tease out. Like, so for example, you know, you bring up a good point. Like, if let's say somebody has like this excessive, you know, internal rotation on one side, on their like their left side or something, right? And and therefore they're more prone to some knee and hip issues or something. So you know that, but then it that torque also makes them more explosive when they go a, di a direction like how do you decide because i've i've seen examples of that of where they will they'll break down like some super athlete or like and i'm thinking of a picture pitcher right now who's able to like throw like just abnormally fast and they find out that's because they have this like little bit of internal rotation that's yeah, some asymmetry yeah uh, it's some asymmetry going on but it works to their benefit when it comes to whipping a baseball so how do you decide like, okay, this is something that I'm going to leave alone or this is something I want to fix. Once again, it comes back to symptoms, but like that you got to reverse engineer special athletes. Like we used to like in college, it was, you know, get everybody progressively stronger at basic exercises and their athleticism goes up mm -hmm. pretty cool. But when you're older athletes, now you're getting into your mid twenties, getting to your early thirties. Well, how much more strength can you rinse out? Like, I don't know how much more strength mm -hmm. to go get to mm -hmm. increase performance. Now, with that being said, when you're watching the, them create these forces, you go, well, back to your point, that's what makes them special. Now, if they're symptomatic, then we have to start looking at some other things. But when I see, quote unquote, valgus, which we can argue if it's valgus or not, when you see these knees collapse in, no, that internal hip rotation they have is special. And that's what allows them to have like these, you can go down the rabbit hole and like pressure gradients and, you know, the PRI model if you want, but these, these physics that go into it, that allows them to be like a super ball and just pop off the ground using not muscular strategies, but using like tenderness and ligament yeah, and then they're so elastic yeah. and you're like, oh my God, like. You're telling me weights is going to make that better? Yeah, like yeah. you're crazy. They're, it's li yeah. they're literally outliers. It's funny. I had this conversation with my wife uh, the other day because there was we were at this uh, event and uh, there was this person walking by and they had the legs of a six foot tall person, but they were like five nine. Oh, right. And I said, I bet that person performs really well in running sports. I bet you they either run distance or whatever. So we had this conversation. I talked about Michael Phelps and there was this great picture I saw years ago, Michael Phelps. Uh, they showed his leg length next to the world champion marathon runner. Now, the marathon runner was like 5'9". Michael Phelps is like 6-something. But Michael Phelps' legs are as long as the guy is super short. I said his body's built to swim. This person's body's built to run. At the level that you train people, at that level, you have special differences, many of them genetic. So you can't necessarily apply what I would do for the average person because 
It's not going to work for the, I mean, how different is that level? Cause you trained at the highest level of college. Mm -hmm. How different is the level going from college to pro? Oof. I mean, in every aspect different, but like you still see very similar body types. It's just, do they have enough skill? Mm. And that's where that one comes in. Uh, but to go back to your, uh, the point you were making earlier, what I find is fascinating is the higher level athlete you work with, the more you progress exercises. Really? Oh, interesting. Why is that? Because I look at it like this. If they're creating these forces elastically, reactively, like you can't create those same forces in a weight room. I, I don't mm. care how mm. strong you are. Like jump, like watching some of these athletes do 360 dunks or backflip dunks, basically. I mean, they're doing the craziest stuff in the air, these aerials and being able to drop their shin angle, like some of these guards that, that make them change direction. Like their shins are hovering over the yeah. ground. And when you see those angles, you're like, and those cuts, there's no way I can replicate that force in a weight room scenario. That's true. I mm. can't add enough load. They'll crumble. Not so, to mention if you load them outside of that range of motion, get them too strong, and then you ask them to go do that explosively. like Then you're taking them. So that's the thing I'm, I'm learning about myself and my own evolution of training was when I trained to be awesome, right? I wanted to be big, strong, you know, look the part. Then I started realizing, okay, I live in external rotation. I live in supination. So now I'm doing all the things that's the exact opposite of what you need for jumping and change of direction. And you're like, oh, so like being cock strong might not be, <laughs> you know, in this context of lifting weights might not be the best thing for mm. high velocity, mm. high speed sports. Now, with that being said, you do need to load. And that's where I go back to my point. You got to regress these exercises. And now it's like, okay, instead of taking a traditional heavy back squat. Well, maybe it's just a leg press. Yeah. Maybe it's a Smith machine squat. Wow. Maybe it's like, take the learning curve out. Cause all I want is the stress. Mm. I need to give them the stress to get a response to elicit an adaptation. I don't care what vessel it comes in. Mm. So to Sorry. put differently, yeah. you're taking the skill out of the strength training so that they could just focus on the tension. Just mm. on the, just on that, the mechanical load. Yes. But what I really find fascinating, and this is where my my evolution is, is, is gone to, is now I take that skill component and I take it more to sport. So now I want that in movement strategies that's outside of sport. Got it. The gray area. Now explain back in, that. Explain that. Yeah, more. for sure. So I'll say the white area is doing the skill, like playing basketball. Right. Crossovers, jumps, you know, aerials, whatever. And then the black area is resistance training. Well, there's that gray area that you can increase movement efficiency to increase movement capacity. And that's where it's, if they lack something, for example, they don't have a lot of good, or they don't have enough IR to allow them to change direction as well as they could. Well, what movement strategies can I build uh, within that mm -hmm. that allows them to move better and then get it in high velocities, but it also doesn't beat them up because I can't, I mean, we play 82 games in a year, yeah. right? Or regular season, 3.4, 3.5 games per week. How are you going to do that without beating them up? So now you got to hijack a lot of things. And that's where, I mean, I, I pull from everywhere. I pull from, and it's controversial in our, in my space, but it's like Franz Bosch. I like a lot of his stuff. Mm. Like some of his stuff makes a lot of sense. Uh, but then I look at ballet. I look at, freestyle wrestling. I look, mm. I mean, I look everywhere to look at what angles do those guys create because for them to be successful in their sport that I, I need the same in mind, but I can't do what they do on the court because that takes a lot of, that taxes them. So how do those guys train? And then I try to incorporate with our athletes based off their structure and based off their strategies. That's really interesting. I was, I'm just racking my brain on this in terms of like that high level of an athlete. Like, are you a little bit more focused on like decelerating type movement as opposed to, you know, cause obviously they've mastered, um, that, that ability to create and generate force and torque and, and, you know, get into these explosive movements, but the, the control of it at this level and, and the, the stability of it, um, you know, is that like a, even more of an, an emphasis that you have in your programming? That's such a good question. The way I look at it is you got to give them what they don't get. So for example, mm. they already do a ton of plyometrics. Like let's remove what sport is for a second. And like, we're not tallying scores anymore and we're not competing against one another. Let's yeah. just yeah. look at what they actually do on the court. Yeah, right? their whole game is plyometrics. The whole game is plyometrics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the whole game is hand combat and the whole game is bodying somebody up and then moving in the frontal plane in a certain way. Like remove all that and then look at the sport for what it truly is and go, 
probably don't need to do a lot more of that Mm -hmm. because they already get that. So back to your point, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do decelerating work. Now, how you do that really depends on the impact that it can have on the athlete. So when I say impact, it's like high level plyometrics, like playing the sport is very impactful. Like it has a ton of impact on the joints, ligaments, tendons, et cetera. So when I do eccentric training, like I got to think one or two things. Am I doing it for high velocities or am I doing it for strength? And so utilizing means like high eccentric drops. Like I like I, I got credit for a, this movement called a kettlebell drop lunge. So mm-hmm. basically you start with it tall, you hold it in between oh, yeah, your legs and then you drop down and catch it and then you can do it rhythmically. Yeah. And so what that does, it doesn't beat up the joints, but it's high velocity eccentric training. Also, there's rhythm and coordination. There's a lot of aspects that is sport. And so that's where you can get a lot of eccentric load, but it doesn't beat them up. Hmm. Also on the same token, you can do a lot of tempos uh, where you take, for example, like a Bulgarian split squat, tempo that three seconds, five seconds on the way down, one second pause, explode up. Now I'm training the eccentric portion. I'm just doing it through a different means. There, I'm chasing physical adaptations. Like I'm chasing, you know, hypertrophy, things that you see in bodybuilding. So now I've seen a bit of a trend in in um, strength training in terms of like um, the platforms and the different angles and being able to kind of place uh, the ankles uh, a little more in, you know, supinated or a a different type of a position, pronation, where um, you're trying to create and control that kind of force. Um, Now, explain to me, like, how is that something like you're incorporating now? I've I've seen this in a few different um, modalities out there uh, for athletes. Like, like where's uh, the thought process in that so like polish boxes for example yeah uh, for the audience the polish box is really simple it's a plyo box except they have slants so in other words it makes like a roof like a house or it makes like a ditch so it goes uh basically a triangle or a reverse triangle and then they have different grades that allows certain responses Mm -hmm. so what i like doing with them is doing low level plyometrics or extensive based plyometrics where you're jumping on this ramp but your feet are going into supination and then doing the exact same thing, Hmm. jumping straight up and down, even though we're jumping straight up and down, my feet are feeling supination and pronation. So the thing, same things that I get in change of direction. The one thing that you see in change of direction drills, who does change of direction drills like extensively? What type of athlete? Yeah. Or I'm just saying like, like who trains that extensively? That means like you'd be going back and forth cutting for a long period of time. Most of the time when you see change of tennis, direction, tennis, drills, yeah, or, tennis is, yeah, you see that basketball. in sport, but yeah, that's like a high level right, right, in right. basketball. Yeah, yeah. Right. You don't see that in normal person. Exactly. Yeah. But when you're seeing it in training, then you're like, oh, no one just goes back and forth and does a ton of change of direction. Like mm-hmm. they don't sets and reps that necessarily. So when I think, well, how is they're training their foot and ankle to handle change of direction? They don't even build a general base for it. They just rely on the sport to make that happen. Mm. So how do I get long? Like expect like the best way to look at it is like GPP for the lower leg for change of direction. Mm-hmm. Like how do you get that? And a great way of doing it is just jumping on plyo boxes where you have these ramps and it forces your foot to have supination and pronation aspects. Speaking of which, cool. um, this was very interesting. I'm not a huge uh, basketball fan, but I'm a huge fan of athletic training. And I was, I don't know, this maybe a few months ago, we were all watching basketball on TV and I noticed something and only because I don't normally watch it. And I said, man, nobody's wearing high tops like they used to back in the day. Everybody's got like these mid tops or low tops. That seems like a big change. Cause when I was a kid, everybody wore high, high tops. tops. Why, why did that change? What was it? Now my guess was you just have more movement and mobility and it probably, although this may sound counter, probably reduced uh, injury because you're not so limited, but is, am I right? What was the deal? My understanding is it started with Kobe. I think Kobe was the first one to... That's a prevailing theory that I've heard. Oh, is it? Yeah, that his his injury after that, he started the whole trend of the, the lower lower. Of shoes. the lower, yeah. yeah. So that, that I don't know how true it is, but he is one of the first that I've ever seen go low top and like and everybody buy it. Like everybody jumped on that train because mm-hmm. they were like, oh, it's Kobe's and they're cool. But from my understanding, what went into that was his experience as a soccer player. Mm-hmm. And when you watch soccer, there's no high tops in soccer. No, right. What, like to me, like I thought that was fascinating because you got spikes. Yeah, you're planted even harder. Change of direction yeah. with a with a fucking ball. You're you on one leg time. Dig into the surface yeah. though, too a bit. I was like, those the are the guys that are going to get jacked up the most. And yeah. then you watch DBs, 
running back or not running backs, but like DBs and wide receivers and those are skill sport or skill positions. I never thought they were low tops as well. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about it, it just makes a lot of sense. I think it was just shoemakers at the time trends, like just things that just at that point made sense, but really wasn't validated. And that's the thing that I'm, I was talking about earlier is like, if you step outside the box, sometimes, I mean, it's high risk, high reward, but Sometimes it could fall on your yeah. face too. <laughs> Speaking of evolution, um, basket the, the evolution of strength training in basketball, I find absolutely fascinating. I, I I think that's probably one of the last sports to really adopt. I mean, of course they all use it now, but it was probably one of the last sports to really adopt strength training. Football being the first, when they first adopted it versus now, what do the evolutions of strength training look like, and how's the athletes change? Because I remember them in the, if I want I want to say in the '90s, early 2000s, they were big. They were trying to get them real big, mm-hmm. and now maybe they're much more svelte. Like, what's what, what's the deal with the evolution of the strength training? Uh, man, I remember. So I played college basketball, like the lowest level of college basketball. So that was 2005 to nine. And so even that small rev- like evolution from then, like it was almost like don't train in season because it's going to mess up your shot. Oh, like yeah, that yeah. was one that I was like, Jesus That was Christ. a big one. <laughs> and now I look back on I'm like, that's probably one of the most ridiculous things that you can ever say. <laughs> uh-huh. But at the same time, it also makes a lot of sense because what was adopted, it was football training principles. Yeah. They're adopted into basketball. So if you go and do a heavy bench press session and then you go shoot immediately after, I agree. That is not good. Yeah. yeah. That is it's not like good at all. Changes your yeah. timing. A hundred percent. Like that feel, like there's nothing like the feel. And that's when you see like the best, best basketball players when they shoot the ball. Mm-hmm. There's something, it's just so special. It, it, the way it comes off the fingertips. I mean, I I can still, I will shoot for the next 10 years and I still can't even come close to that kind of touch, yeah. you know? And it's just something, when you see that and you go, oh, strength training, like types of strength training, it actually makes a lot of sense. And so anyways, back to the evolution. So it was basically don't train in season, just only maybe do, do it off season. Uh, but it was that, it's like, let's get these refrigerators Let's try to make the biggest po- possible athlete that we possibly can. Cause, but the sport was that like the nineties was beating and banging down low. Yeah. 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 Right. And it's now it's so much more finesse. So it's not only like, and this is the part that we can't compartmentalize, you know, training. It's also style of play. Mm, you know, what a like, good point. Think about football back, you know, I mean, there's still like, you put a bunch of heavy linemen up front and they can't move really well, but they're just really strong and it's run up the gut, you know, a wishbone or whatever you call it. There's all these types of offense. And I remember helping out in college football early in my career where they actually wanted more mobile linemen. So now that you have more mobile linemen, you got to change the way you train. I think that's what happened in basketball. The style of play changed, thus the need. 100%. I mean, you're, 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 well, you're explain, look at having wide receivers in the NFL. I mean, uh, the part of why we see like the Tyreeks and these guys that are so fast now is they can be petite and small and quick like that. You play football in the successful. 80s. Yeah, you play football in the 80s, you're getting jacked up if you're that 100%. little. So 100%, the game has changed too. So. I mean, when you see the rules change, like yeah. the rules now, you know, they, you can't touch certain ways. protect you. Well, then what wins speed? Yeah. And so that's where it's like, ah, maybe I put more eggs in that basket opposed to being as physical. And so Mm. that's when you see now the three point shot is now like basically from half court. It's like, that's why some of these guys can get away with it at a super high level where speed really wins. I mean, don't get me wrong. So, like there's, there's all sorts of tactics that go into it and the development and the structure or the DNA of your team, I should say. But it's really fascinating to see what really wins. It's fast pace or physicality. So no, it's always fun to see when those two teams match up. I, I, I'd love to hear some some personal experience for you. I mean, you were already coaching at a high level at at Stanford. Then you go to the NBA. Uh, what have been some highlights and moments like watching the game and watching these these super athletes? Like, what have been some cool highlights for you? I mean, the finals was special. Yeah, like it was probably. And obviously we we lost, but the coolest thing was watching them celebrate. And I know that sounds really weird, and it's like untraditional. For us to like like but when i watched it it was like dude this is the highest level of achievement mm-hmm. we were just on the other side of it yeah but i'm like dude i'm still in this building and i'm like from yeah. redneckville you know usa <laughs> and i get to just stand here and watch this confetti drop now obviously we, i would love to see our colors drop <laughs> right. but just even being in that moment it's like we're the last two teams and this was th- it's that like was achievable it's there it was know, so special well yeah. also what is it like um because unfortunately i have never been able to experience playing for or being a part of a team that made a championship run 
talk about the uh, the culture of it because I mean I even not ever experiencing that there's you know when you have this mm -hmm. di this dynamic like could did you know early in the season I mean could you could you feel the energy no no <laughs> that's the best really? part. shut up really that's the best part I've been a part of three different championship teams and what's interesting is everyone I can look back on it was like oh we actually did it wow really you don't know it while you're in it I don't think. I don't think you know it when you're in it. Hmm. I think you're just, this is what we do. And it just so happens to go our way. I really think like, don't get me oh, wrong. Wow. There's that mentality. Yeah, we we're built for this. We're built different. Like I get that. Like there's that facade. There's that, you know, that confidence you have to externally show. And, and yeah, we knew this was happening. Well, sure. You know, but the reality is like, can everybody pinpoint that moment where we're like, oh, it's here. I mean, hmm. you can fascinate some stories, but reality I mean, we were coming off the bubble. The bubble yeah. was eight and zero, very successful. That was our own little championship. But we're like, hey, we we belong. That didn't necessarily go. We belong in the finals. Like that's that's a big difference. Like <laughs> yeah, you right. win eight games in a row, great. <laughs> but like going to the finals the next year, that's that's a big leap. And that was, I mean, our first round was extremely tough. But I would say if I had to like pinpoint a, like a fantasy moment to say, hey, we can do this thing, like we we're doing it, it was after the first round win. After the first round win, that was the first time the organization's been in the playoffs for 12 years, I think. Remind me who you played in the first round? That uh, year? Lakers. Oh, okay. Lakers. So, of course. So, that was where, you know, that was that was a team that was projected to do it all. Of course. So, to just, yeah. After we did that one, we're like, oh, gosh. Like, I'm not saying like we arrived, but it was like, Yo, no, we're here. Like, we, we can do this. Well, let's talk about the bubble, training the bubble. What did anything change or was it just business as usual? Oh no, everything changed. Like the it was because of the environment. So we were under extreme constraints. I mean, obviously with the testing, everybody's in their own hotel rooms. I mean, when we first got there, we had to quarantine in our hotel for like three days straight. I think it was something like that. So So you couldn't bring family or anybody, or could oh, you? No. But then they had to also quarantine. Oh no. So by yourself. By that's yourself. It. Now I think the finals. I think they were allowed to bring family, but they still had to quarantine just like how we quarantined, wow. you know? So, uh, but you know, to finish off the regular season, I mean, we had to be there three days isolated in your room and that was bananas. But like, I'm sending guys workouts via FaceTime, <laughs> you know, or text, and then I'll FaceTime them like forum check or whatever you want to call it. And it, it was wild times. And so when we finally got released, you know, it felt like, <laughs> like coming out into the public, we finally got released to do things together. Uh, we were slotted times because we all had to share facilities. So I don't, I don't remember how many teams, maybe like 19 teams were in it or something like that. So we had only so many facilities to have practice, have weight room access. And so everyone was slotted. I believe it was anywhere between two and a half to three hours. And then you had to get up out of there. And so like, where are you going to train? And so what do you got to do? So in most scenario, you can do a lot of personal training. You can do one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, but because of that constraint, what we decided to do as a team was, you know what, we're going to do a team lift. And that was where it was like college days. And that, that got me, that's my wheelhouse. So running that whole program, like a college program, that was the most fun. That, if I can pinpoint like one sp special moment in my career, like you said, that mm -hmm. I actually, that was looking back on that. It was dope because you got the best athletes in the world and it's like marching to the same beat yeah. and we're all in the weight room and it's like trap bar deadlift day and everybody's treating it like it's a max day. Coaches in there were all yelling <laughs> and it's like a football <laughs> environment. We're like, yo, like this is in the NBA. Like this ain't college football. Like, it was, it was cool. And then it just so happened to have success. So. so do you not think that some of that bled into the next season as far as like that camaraderie and everything that you probably built during that time? You well, think? How we trained actually transitioned into that. And so what we trained before that, like, I didn't even know what the NBA was like. I was just winging it. Like, I mean, we we're all winging it to a certain degree, but especially during that first half of the season before the pandemic hit, I was like, I, I think we're going to train now. I th uh, do you want to lift today? Like, I, I, <laughs> I didn't really know how to, you know, because I'm used to saying, all right, right. this is what we got. Yeah. We'll be here at eight. But at that level, it doesn't really work that way. You know, it's your coworker. You don't like talk to your coworker that way. Yeah, you like they're a student. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not a. Did you have a? Did you did you get a like a lesson in that? Like, was there your? Nah, no, no. I, I got, did you come in already? Wise. I, I came up? in. I was like, you know what? Like, I know what. I I, I feel the vibe. Like, <laughs> just just be cool. Like, yeah. be cool. And then the moments that <laughs> you, you gotta like put your foot down, just be like, yo, what are we doing? Like, talk to him like as a, it's your boy. And you're like, I'm disappointed in you. Like, <laughs> not like get the out of my space. Like you can't pull that stuff. Like I mean, you could, 
I mean, I think if you're close enough, with, there's times where I'm close enough with a player where I can like be <laughs> get into old core because you know them. Yeah, yeah, because we're cool, like, and, and yeah. they know that I have the best interest for them. Right. If it's not, then it looks like it's self interest. And you know, at the end of the day, like these guys get paid what they get paid, and I get paid what I get paid. So if there's controversy. Who's gonna right. who's gonna kick rocks first? You right. Know what right. I'm yeah. saying? right. So now you you mentioned off air that you know knowing what you know now, you have this this great experience that. Uh, high level at college, now MBA. Now, now you say, if you were to go back and do college, you'd do it differently. Yeah. I, How I, so? I would do it so different. Wow. Um, so one thing that we did in college, specifically at Stanford that I really enjoyed was we implemented this model called microdosing. Yeah. And so microdosing performance, I think we talked about I remember I went up, I was going to bring that up. I'm like, you're doing revolutionary stuff uh, at Stanford. <laughs> so how would you like change all that? It was already so, next level. Well, the good thing is I got to bring that to the, professional environment. And so now it was like a comparison. It wasn't not a intentional comparison, but the difference is I would do multiple sessions in a day. That's what I would do. Very different. So explain microdosing to the audience who didn't for sure didn't listen to that first episode. Great point. Uh, so microdosing in a team sports setting and in season training, you generally see teams lift one to two times a week. <clears throat> and the problem with that is let's say somebody misses a lift then that's 50% of your training gone mm -hmm. 50 to hundred percent of your training gone for that seven day period, which is a huge problem or yeah. you got to make it up. Now, if we're just saying, here's a good example in, in conference play, you play Thursday and Saturday. So if I miss a lift, well, I can't make up that lift, especially the exact same type of lift to listen adaptation, because what that's going to do is going to put me in the hole. And now I can't have optimal competition right. or be ready for competition. So then you're now negating and like doing like a half ass job of, or training stimulus just to get the lift in. So that was a problem I had. I was like, you know what? There's not enough opportunity because we try to condense this whole session. And so these sessions in season would look anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour long. And so when you think about it, you probably surf the force velocity spectrum. So you start with your warm up, you know, your speed or power work, your strength work, and then your accessory work. That's a typical mm -hmm. lift. Well, if you layer all these different types of stressors into one lift, yes, you could get a positive adaptation, but with that positive adaptation also is going to be, is also going to have other aspects like delayed onset muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. So if we have some of these, you know, uh, unwanted symptoms, then that's going to affect player development. That's going to affect skill development. That's going to affect practice. That's going to affect competition. So what I thought about was, well, instead of doing these like mega dose sessions, like an off season workout length, let's do a micro session. So now let's split these lifts into anywhere between 15 to 25 minute sessions. And then instead of doing all of those stressors in one lift, Reduced I'm going to separate. Yeah. I'm going to separate every one of those stressors. And what I found out is I can train not only more often, but more intense. Because think about it. If you went to the gym and all you had was cleans. All right, you got 20 minutes to get cleans in. You could get as heavy as you possibly could and you could fail. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to feel it the next day. Mm -mm. So you're like, oh, but where did it all come from? Yeah, because like, there's that cumulative stress. It's not yes. just the acute stress, right? It's the cumulative over time. Bingo. I, I experienced this myself. I did I did these all-day workouts where I lift one hour for 20 minutes. Then I wouldn't work out for two hours. Then I do it again 20 minutes. And I did this all day long. When I looked at the total volume, like this is way more than I would ever do in one workout. But it didn't feel like it. A thousand percent. Yeah. And where did that all come from? Well, like Olympic lifters. Yes. They train multiple times a day. That's how they train. And so I found that the Norwegian project. Are you guys familiar with that? No. So this was um, the Norwegian powerlifting team, I believe. They took on this Olympic lifting coach. I forgot where he was from, though. Um, somewhere Eastern Bloc. And anyways, he he's an Olympic lifting coach. Comes over to the Norwegian powerlifting team and introduced Olympic lifting training frequencies to the powerlifting. Now, this is already an elite level powerlifting mm -hmm. group. All they did was make more sessions. They just increased, they doubled their training frequency within a week. So instead of doing three or four lifts, they did eight to nine lifts. And, and they all, corrected for volume and all that stuff. Or it was the same load, same workload. So in other words, like, yes, yes, okay. they, yes. They corrected the volume, but it, they were just in these micro sessions. Right, right, right. And then all of a sudden, Boom, PRs, 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 PRs. Yep. And you're sitting there like, ah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm experiencing mm -hmm. this right mm -hmm. now. We we just created a program that we're launching next month. And 
we I basically have taken the three big workouts that I used to do and I've split it up over like six days in these 20, 25 minutes and Brilliant. experiencing incredible results. And I feel and I feel better than I ever felt. My joints feel better. I'm recovering faster. I feel just as strong. The results are as good or better. It's it's amazing. I think for strength training, that. uh intensity tends to be over overused or abused and frequency in this way tends to not get looked at. hundred And I think if you look at frequencies this way, you'd be amazed at how your body tends to well, react and respond. How it happened at Stanford was really simple. Like <laughs> we come in, we're before we got to Stanford, we are at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And like, you know, it's blue collar and, you know, the, we had success with that. So we're trying to bring this blue collar mentality into Stanford, which is very white collar. And we're like, well, lifting every day is pretty tough. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, that's hard. You know, let's, let's do that. And so how I pinned it off was let's make it a part of practice. So lifting and practice are not two separate events. Mm -hmm. And it was also another aspect was when you look at stress holistically, if you have separate sessions throughout the day, well, logistically, I mean, that's 15 to 20 minutes of commute time. Yeah. And now like we're wasting their day because they have to more commute. Sure. So our idea was like, instead of doing like that same rudimentary, like, all right, everybody on the line, let's do this five to 10 minute warm up, And everybody's doing the song and dance before we go into our practice. Let's make it a strength warm up or a power warm up. Oh, interesting. And so now it's a weight room session. So our warm up is actually done in the weight room. Now we contrasted some sprinting and we did some specialized things where we go from a squat to a jump or a trap bar deadlift into a sure. sprint, you know, whatever. But they got to experience those high velocities and change the direction to prepare them for sport. But then we, so we microdosed. And so that's where we trained on game day. And that was weirdly like revolutionary in college basketball at the time, which I'm like, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but it, it caught a lot of credit. And so then taking that now to professional sports. So what I did there was we only trained one time a day in college. What we do in professional sports is we train anywhere between two to three times a day. Wow. And I know that sounds wild. It, it really does. But when you're doing these micro sessions, mm -hmm. it makes a ton of sense. So let's just take a game day, for example. Most teams have what they call a shoot around. So that's, you know, around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock during the day. They go to the arena, get shots up, maybe do some tactical stuff where they're looking over the thing that they're about to do to the team that night. And so that's an opportunity, pre or post that. And then you have the game, pre or post that. So you have four opportunities to get lifts in. And so if we break them up into these micro sessions, then for instance, you can do accessories in the morning, wake up, then you do your tune up or your, you know, your turbo, like we're trying to get fast before the game, potentiation, mm -hmm. and then post-game, engine. Like, this is where we're going to work on tensile strength, post-game. Wow. Did you get any flat? So there was a, a viral video. You were oh, in it. Oh, God. You yeah. were a there was a viral video that, that, you, so were, bad. <laughs> oh, you, that you that you were in. And uh, I was like, oh, shit, there's my boy right there. Because, and, it, and I think it even made TV everything of you training uh, with the guys. Yeah. I think after one of the – was it one of the playoff games? No, nah, it was after – A season game? It was after the – the the Bay Area team. Oh, man, that's why. I, maybe that's why I remember. Maybe that's why I remember it. it was after that win. So, <laughs> so tell tell me. Tell, first of all, explain to the audience what 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 that was and the, and what happened. And then I, I I didn't know if there if you got any backlash from it or anything. Without. Yeah, it was it was catch twenty two. Uh, it was good and bad. Okay, uh, the it. good part was uh, it's exposing uh, the rest of the world that we that you know basketball players lift weights and like we we take care of our bodies. And this is how we take care of our bodies. We don't do it by doing passive modalities. We're not just sitting there and getting massage treatments and getting these spa like, mm -hmm. you know, sessions. No, we, we work like we do our, we do what we can to build up our bodies. And the best time to do that is technically post game. The reason why I bring that up is going back to the example where you play three to four times a week. Well, if you lift heavy to have an adaptation on any of the other days, so the rest days, well, holistically, stress is still really high. Yep. So they never get to recover. So the idea behind microdosing truly is make your high days stupid high. And so that your low days are ridiculously low. Mm. And so that you can recover. And that's the idea behind it is when sh once you build up into this uh, or once you adapt, then at the end of season, you're setting PRs. Like you're the strongest at the end of the season. Wow. That's the whole point of this yeah, thing. What a trip. I mean, we had guys that were being able to express force on our force plates and we have data to support it that they're setting lifetime PRs going 
into the playoffs. Wow, that's that's, that, that's, that's so crazy. counter. Yeah, yes. any because the, the the old school mentality peak is, before the season. Yeah, just peak before season and just make sure they don't get hurt. Yeah, just sustain it's so that. funny how you look at it and you're like, well, when does people get hurt? They get hurt in the beginning of season, probably because there's such a sh acute response yeah. to all the things they've been mm -hmm. doing, and at the end of season. Mm -hmm. So yep. what do you think happened? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. like you peak early. All right, we're we're. You've done a lot of training up until that point. Then you add on high volume practices and then you add on games. Boom. Something happens. Yep. And then you look at the end of the season and you detrain because you're not training at wow. the intensities that you were training. So you're actually getting less of an athlete. What an interesting perspective on that. Huh. And yeah. so counter. So let's talk. Uh, so here's something that I, I noticed with these all day workouts. Wait, I wanted to hear the controversy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me hear the shit, bro. You let so, him go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem was, so yeah. what we were doing in that session where we're doing oscillating isometrics. So what that is, yeah. is you go to the bottom range and we're just pulsing at the bottom. It's really, really good for tendon health. Okay. Okay. So then every, like, you know, the internet personal trainers are like, oh my God, they're not even going full depth. They're not even doing full range of motion. And I'm like, out of all the lifts, like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one, you know, <laughs> banging out great looking pull-ups. So I was pumped about that. I was like, yeah, yeah, we do that. But the, the pulsing ISOs got so much controversy and I'm like, oh my like, God. What's this jazzercise stuff? The facts, you know, and the yeah. problem is you see me doing it right beside a guy, like yeah. showing him yeah. and it was like, oh, look, he doesn't know what he's talking about about and i'm like word <laughs> all right yeah. um, i think leave it's, it to the internet you know? yeah exactly. it's, of course. it's important for trainers and coaches to know that the the when you start at when you're training the average person there's a, there's it's very different at what you look at it's very different how you train the person the higher the level the more specific and specialized and when you're training at the highest highest level it's going to look nothing like you would train the average person. Even if you train a fit average person, it's going to look nothing like it. And, I, and this took me 10 years to fit, really learn as a trainer because I would be critical too. What is that? It's not a full squat or why aren't they doing full range? In 10 years of my career, I was like, oh, that's not the same at all. It's very different. It's very specific. I had the exact same when I was in college and I got asked on a lot of podcasts when I was working uh, in those ranks, oh, would you ever do NBA? And I'm like, no, they don't train. Like, <laughs> I had the same mentality. I'm like, nah, man, like I wouldn't do NBA and look at my ass now. Yeah. <laughs> I just try to figure it out. So I have a question for you because uh, I, 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 could, I can't quite figure out why this happens. I'm pretty sure you know the answer to this, but when I would do those all day workouts, it, you know, and I, this is how I would break it down. I do like three exercises, two or three sets each bench, you know, I don't know, bench, deadlift. Uh, overhead press or something like that. And I do a couple sets at 9 a.m., then again at 11 a.m., then again at 1 p.m. And I noticed in the middle of that whole thing, because I'd finished at like 6 p.m., by the third or fourth session, I felt stronger mm -hmm. than I did at the beginning. Even though I should be fatigued, even though I've just done two or three micro workouts earlier, mm -hmm. I noticed I got stronger and stronger and stronger. And then fatigue would set in in the last two or three, I'd start to get weaker. Is that like a, a a potentiation thing that's going on? Is my CNS ramping up? Like what's happening? I think there's multiple things going on and I like to pair it with another example. So when you talk to any basketball player and you ask them when they got their first dunk, they would always say, yeah, after pickup. Mm. And you're like, ah, that makes a lot of sense actually, because there's this aspect when we create so much tension to elicit a certain you know movement pattern, rather it's slow, like a heavy deadlift or fast, like a sprint or a jump. There's this aspect of, uh, or there's this sweet spot where you turn on the right muscles and turn off the right muscles. And there's this coordination to it. Mm. And so I think when you get into your sets, you actually start getting more and more coordinated throughout the day. The efficiency is just grew. Exactly. So interesting. that's all expression of force is, is efficiency. Yeah. And so, and don't get me wrong, like, there's probably opportunities where guys like have their best jump in the beginning. Well, for sure. But there's like a lot of other things that could be involved in that as well. But most basketball players, I mean, I'm telling you, I've asked this question to that, so You just many. made me think back to the very first time I ever dunked was after, a, you know, two hours of a pickup game. There you go. And you just created so much efficiency. And so like when That's fatigue wild. is actually like a good indicator of efficiency. And so that's where I think a lot of people look at fatigue as a bad thing. I look at fatigue as a great thing because you look at one or two things, like there's mm. movement competency or there's movement inefficiency. Mm. And so that's where it's like, oh, do you truly master it? Can you still express these outputs even though you're under fatigue? Because that's how you organize. And when you see it in sport, that's when you're like, oh, that's where like you see crazy fourth quarter 
performances. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you see great first quarter performances, but right. you know, it's like your body is fine tuning and becoming more organized. Bingo. It's interesting. Calibrating. I was, there was this God, there was this old show. I think it was on discovery channel where they were, they would attach sensors to athletes and have them perform so certain athletic feats. Show? I think it was. Yeah. And they had Randy Couture on there. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but you know, MMA. Yeah. yeah. Fight Where we interviewed the guy from that show. Yeah. And he, he yeah. Randy Couture, he got a, like this, medicine ball type thing with all these sensors attached to his body and the medicine ball uh, registering force. And he squeezed it like in a headlock and he compared him to the average person. And they found that his muscles were activating and coordinating very differently. And so he was able to squeeze it harder and longer than somebody who was actually bigger than he was, mm-hmm. but it's because of the efficiency his body was it just through training and practice. A hundred percent. And that's really what it all boils down to. Well, I'm so glad you brought up that point or in that specific story, because I think the most important part of microdosing is how it doesn't compete with other stressors. Mm. When we look at stressors holistically, let's look at, okay, if I'm developing skill, well, that's motor learning. Yeah. I mean, motor learning exists in lifting as well, but let's just compartmentalize it for a second. So motor learning, skill development. Um, Then we look at physical training. We're getting the muscles bigger, faster, stronger, right? And then we look at the sport itself and that's the reactive component and the actualization of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is if physical training has these negative effects in these mega dosages, well, how do you think that's going to affect motor learning and skill development? So that's the thing I don't want to do. I want to increase their physical capacity, but I cannot do it to the point where it sacrifices skill development and competition. All three of these areas have to coordinate together and be able to be in sync. So that's where if you take certain aspects, like going back to the example, speed and power, heavy lift or strength, and then accessory work, if you just compartmentalize those and you organize it along with their skill development, then you'll never compete against those stressors. So really the 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 benefit, the value, the, the, the effectiveness of microdosing training is less about what it's doing and more about what it's not doing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you're not competing as much. You're not uh, forcing the body to adapt or to choose where it's going to adapt and to choose where it's going to move its resources. And here's the key with this, and I, th- I think a lot of people need to realize this, is when you're equ- when you're equating total volume, total work, it's it's pretty similar. If you have two long workouts versus four small ones or five or six small ones, the difference is in what you're talking about. Because you're doing those frequent kind of signaling <clears throat> with smaller sessions, you're not doing maybe as much damage, not fatiguing the body as much, and allowing the person to train with less injury, less pain, mm-hmm. less all that stuff. I mean, it's really just not messing with what they do. Yeah. And I think we get away from that sometimes because it's about what we do, like strength and conditioning coaches. I got to get them bigger, faster, stronger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. But if they're not a better basketball player, then none of it yeah, matters at all. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that's what I had to, if I could go back to college, I would do different. Now at the same time, oh, there's 17 to 21 year olds. They adapt to anything. So it really doesn't yeah. matter. But I would be a lot more, more like scalpel than I would like hammer. Like mm. I was in college. So would you have added more? workouts then to your college group. And then I would take that even just out of my own curiosity from the high school level, because I'm working with athletes there yeah. specifically uh, just in terms of like creating these micro dosing workouts, but then also go, moving that same method in season and keeping and maintaining that alongside the stress of them. Um, you know, the volume of their actual sport itself, like that would have been something you would have changed. Yeah, I would have done. Now, back to this, the Stanford example, the last thing I wanted to do is have them come in multiple times a day. I would lift pre and post practice. Mm-hmm. Pre practice is more speed, mm. like motor coordination, okay. like things that turn th- things on, turn things on. And Got then, it. like, I mean, like, you're going, like, this is a, if it's a sprint workout, like, it's a sprint workout. If it's to jump higher, I mean, we're doing like high, high plyometrics. Because what's the worst thing after that? Practice? Like, you're not going to experience anything as harsh. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some reactive components that could get you close, but regardless. And then post practice, as long as practice is done well and now it's traditional strength training. Then traditional strength training. Wow. Mm. Now, what about isometrics? You you mentioned the the pulsing in that video. Where does isometrics? So, isometrics, I feel like, is one of the most underutilized training methodologies in just general fitness. Um, And the studies on them are pretty remarkable. It's a. doesn't damage the body. The injury risk is really low. Activates lots of muscle fibers. I mean, you can apply isometri- isometrics to anybody, almost anybody, regardless of fitness level. 
So I would imagine that this is something that you utilized with your athletes as well. It is the bee's knees okay. in, in sports performance right now. Like, Oh, ice, really? Everybody's starting to look at it? Oh, man. It's like, it, it's an abundance. Like there's, I mean, there's courses coming out left and right wow. about how you use it at the highest level of athletes. Early, it makes bro. us feel good. Doesn't that make you feel good a little <laughs> bit, dude? So it is. <laughs> it's a little bit. Early adopter. ISOs are like, they are the bee's knees right now. And for great reason. I mean- you look at, uh, you guys familiar with FRC, the yeah, 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 conditioning, sure. like so their pails and rails is deri der uh, derived from 80s research, yeah. mm -hmm. research that was done in the 80s. And yeah. I was like, well, why don't we just keep looking at that and just apply it in different ways? You look at pails and rails and you're like, that's just an IMTP or an overcoming ISO and a yielding ISO. So why can't we apply those same principles mm -hmm. globally or even more specific? So I like using isometrics in the frontal plane. Mm. And I know a lot of people like I like I like overcoming ISOs to mm, potentiate like Jesus like you overcome it like so what I mean by so you mean like driving against an immovable object, object, object okay. correct and so like that's going to create I mean there's n there's no more motor unit recruitment yeah. in a single lift than a failed deadlift yeah and what is a failed deadlift an isometric yeah so. Well, <laughs> there there's your answer like that's the if you want to create the most amount of force and overcoming ISO now how we do it is through more of like a um, a more favorable position. So it's like a quarter squat position. That's when I'm in my strongest. Mm. You know, I wouldn't do it from the bottom unless I'm trying to build a lift, which- Like a I, power lifter whose bottom is weakest. Yeah, not a basketball exactly. player. Exactly, not a basketball player. Yeah. Like who cares, right? right. Like, and He's now, never getting in a deep squat, so it doesn't matter. For sure. Yeah. Now what I would do if they are symptomatic, like say like patellar tendonitis on a knee, then you could get them in those ranges, but you're doing it for a health spectrum. So that's when I'd use- or I utilize yielding isometrics, mm. which, which means, for example, you start in the top of a squat or a lunge, and then you drop into a mid stance or to a full lunge because you're yielding that force. Got so it. that's where you can utilize like heavy resistance training for that. And once again, going back to the same example, regress the exercise. Like it doesn't have to be a complicated exercise. It could even be a machine. It's just what is that's the the vessel doesn't matter. It's the stress that we're trying to drive. And if it's heavy. Well, let's not make it more complicated, especially if you don't know the athlete's training history or right. you don't have a long time with that athlete. Mm -hmm. Get that through motor skill, like motor learning, like get that through like skill development. Yeah. Get that through like sprinting and jumping and change direction. Don't get that in the weight room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with isometrics, especially with the, uh, where you're overcoming, right? So you're, you're pushing against an immovable object or squatting against an immovable object. For the average person, um, it sounds like the best time to do something like that would be if you're going to do a traditional strength training workout, 45 minute hour workout would be 10 minutes at the beginning, get everything turned on, then get into your workout. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'd say after you're pretty loose and you feel good, okay. that's when you can start ramping it up. Like I would never like start the session or even when I'm loose, I wouldn't start with like a hundred percent effort, rip into a rack. No. You know, you can build it 80, 90 and then Got eventually it. start hitting your work sets. But what I really like doing is I like contrasting that work. I like going against an immovable object and then getting that tension this is for an analogy standpoint, get the tension out of my body. Then I go do something rhythmic and coordinate and coordinated after, for example, like shadow boxing is not a bad example, but oh. like little, like, like low level plyos or like box jumps or death drop jumps, you know, something where it's, it involves some rhythm and coordination. So I can develop all this tension and I'll go use that tension. Interesting. So I like having both of those aspects. I, I rarely train one without the other. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you could do like a high tension in the beginning after you're warmed up. Up and, and loose and then do something like ice skaters or a hundred percent. So that's what, and that's a great example of the change of direction. Well, I do an overcoming ISO into a wall, except one of my sides is facing it. And then I lean into it and I'm only pushing with my back leg. Mm -hmm. So now it's like a ice skater jump, but I'm just creating it with a wall yeah. and I'm holding that position. Now I'm specifically training the angles Angles is what wins. Angles is what performance truly is. Mm -hmm. When you see shin angles low to the ground, you see speed. Yeah. You see that in linear sprinting mm -hmm. and you see in change of direction. So I want to train them in those angles. And what's the safest way to get them down there, but also have a shit ton of load? Overcoming isometrics. Yeah. yeah. And, yep. and, and, and for the listener who's, who's trying to understand this, um, the reason why angles are such are so important is if you're generating, I'm just going to use a number, 100 pounds worth of force, but your angle is not perfect. You're you're gonna lose. There's a, there's a leak in, in in that energy. That hundred pounds can't be applied directly because 
it's like me pushing against the wall, but I'm pushing from under the wall, right? I'm not going to push it directly. I'm not able to create the angle that gives me the direct force. Well, there's also physics involved, right? The yeah. greater the angle and the greater the strength you can have in that angle, the greater tension and like, that you can create on the field or on the court. Right. I mean, that's so... Well, I just reverse engineer from the best in the world, right? 100 meter sprinters are the fastest people in the world. Yep. When you watch them take off, how close are their shins to the ground in those first three steps? Mm -hmm. That is the difference between good starters and elite starters. Look at those shin angles. If it looks almost parallel to the ground, it's organized falling. Like your yeah, best sprint, yeah, is. your best sprint is catching yourself falling. It is. Yeah. And so great track coaches, they actually encourage falling in their acceleration drills hmm. because that's essentially the angle you want to be able to eventually create because that's all it is. It's just organized falling. Yeah, our mutual friend Paul Fabrics does great videos on oh, like where yeah. he breaks down the, awesome. the, yeah. the the angles and yes. stuff like that. Have you seen the most Thousands. yes, the most elite athletes have that ability to like and it's then, like now for, linear is one thing, but back to the point you're bringing, change of direction. Yeah. When you see like bilateral and then knees are in and they're just shimmying left and right, but their shins are about to touch the ground, you're like, How do you guard that? Yeah. <laughs> I I, like I'm just bro, length. Yeah. I just gotta use length. I hope I got a seven foot wingspan because grab onto his shorts. A hundred percent. Foul, foul yeah. hard, yeah. Yeah. foul hard. <laughs> so you know one of the one of the biggest travesties in the strength uh, sports, uh, and we can even include, I guess, muscle building in that is uh, the, this camps. Like, well, bodybuilders train like this, powerlifters train like this, Olympic lifters train like this. Oh, I use kettlebells, or I use, and you, you know, I don't know if we said this off air, but you said, you know, I, I try to take from everything and apply it. And this is for professional sports. I think this applies to the average person as well, who just wants to build an aesthetic physique, you know, that they don't take principles from other strength sports or even athletes in those sports like bodybuilders. I think bodybuilders can learn a lot from Olymp Olympic lifters, maybe not the Olympic lifts, right. but maybe the micro dosing and the well, frequency. You're, Sal, you're driving towards something I wanted to ask Corey, actually. And I, I, if you can, I'd like you to take yourself out of your, you know, NBA and, and basketball mind and actually kind of think like we have to think as like general pop, right? And what are some things that you've learned during your 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 training career that you now would apply to the average person who's just trying to get fit, build muscle? Like how like how would you think like programming differently today with all your knowledge what do you and experience? Keep and what do you omit? Well yeah. like back to Sal's point, like I think what's like fascinating is truly stealing from all these other yeah. disciplines. So for example, if I want massive quads Olympic lifters have fucking quads. Oh, like yeah, their yeah. quad sweeps are unreal. What do they do? A lot of front squats. <laughs> Boom. There you go. Application. Yeah. You know, that, that's a great example. Um, sprinters. Sprinters have glutes and hams. Why? Because they sprint. Yeah. <laughs> so I would apply sprinting to general population or ways to create a lot of force. Mm -hmm. Now, there is skill to sprinting, but there is no skill to throwing a medicine ball really hard. And so that's where going back to the exam or the points we were making earlier, just regressing the exercises to get the adaptation you're looking for. That's what matters the most. An Olympic lifter. Yes. It's a very specialized movement to be able to organize, to lift that weight over their head. But I can still create that same kind of force with a trap bar. Yep. Maybe I don't rack it. So I don't decapitate myself mm -hmm. yeah. with a trap bar, but I can still put that same kind of force, that triple extension. I'm pulling as rapid and violently as possible to have that same adaptation. So things that I would take away from all my experiences in basketball and so apply it to general population is l l like extensive low level plyometrics. So just something as simple as skipping rope. Mm -hmm. Like I want to see 30 minutes nonstop. Mm -hmm. Like if you can work up to something like that, then you won't run into the problems that I've ran into in my career with or with my own body is when I transitioned out of basketball, I went to be a meathead, right? I mm -hmm. wanted to be bigger, faster, stronger. And so in that process, I got away from doing any type of plyometrics. measures. I got away from hooping. I got away from anything that made me athletic. So what I did was I built a body that can write checks that my feet can't catch. Yeah, yeah. And then boom, oh, tourniquet really speaks right to me. Bro. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And then it's now, super. so in my evolution, I was like 226 the last time I talked to you guys. Actually, I, that's so funny. Three days after I tore my Achilles, I came in here and did that podcast yeah, with you right. guys. Yeah, so yeah. I roll it in. That's, I was so high of pain meds too. That was crazy. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about that. I was really worried about that podcast. No, no, you're still sharp though. Yeah, yeah, yeah you were good. You're but good. he's real happy. Yeah. He's super happy. Yeah. Um, but what's happened since that time is my left Achilles is healed. Everything's great. But now my right Achilles 
And that's generally what you see. When you see one go, the other tends to follow suit. Um, Mine is because of a a deformity in my heel. So my Achilles sits obliquely. And so I'm just creating this sheer force all Mm. the time. But there's a said principle to it where if you train it up, it will eventually get stronger. And so what I found out is, okay, I have a 226 body. I like being awesome, but I can't move. Now that I'm in professional sports, I'm more valued by moving not by looking apart. Right. Yeah. And when I look at the rest of the league, I'm like, there's no meatheads here. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, that, that might be a reason. Yeah. And so because I have a background in basketball, I can be involved a lot more. Like in college, I couldn't even hold a basketball or else it's a violation, which is wild. Oh, there's interesting. So many, so many NCAA rules. That's ridiculous. Weird. That is weird. Yeah. But it's like the reason why they did it is because then you could just make an assistant coach a strength coach. And now you have another coach. So that's why they did it. But in professional sports, I can pass, I can shoot, I can, you know, set a screen, I can do all sorts of stuff. So my ability to move is what gets guys to buy in. Like my my ability to handle the ball and one mixtape, like the stuff that I cared about growing up. Like they're like, oh, yo, like Corey's got some stuff, you know? And it's like, oh, I might actually listen to him in the weight room now. So, um... Anyways, where were we going? Low level plyos. Oh, low level plyos. So the first thing I had to do though was, okay, you can't be 226 anymore. Because like, let's just say I'm a Ferrari, which I'm not, but like I'm a Ferrari. Well, I just put a trailer on that Ferrari. So what do you think is going to happen to it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're just hauling around all this mass and it's not going to let you move better. So I've been in this journey over the past like six months of just losing as much, like even good mass so that I can have a more efficient body. And then, man, have I been hitting extensive plyometrics mm. like you wouldn't believe. God, this is what I, I struggle mm. with so bad. So part of I want to get back to playing basketball. Yeah. I miss the sport so much. But he likes to be beefy. I but I like saying you know, but, like, yeah, but it was an ego dragon. Yeah, I know. I know. There were some things that I was able to slay it. I was finally able to slay it. And yeah. once I slayed it, I, I took a step back and I'm like, all right. Like, this is my new journey. My yeah. new journey is Jason Statham, Ryan Gosling. Like, that's, a, <laughs> <laughs> that's my new journey, yeah. you know? Well, I, can, I can get there. Yeah. Well, I, get I there. mean, plyos lean and, and lean. that kind of movement's a skill, and your body forgets it. If you don't, I, you know, this happened to me, it was like a while ago. I was joking about with these guys on the podcast. I went to cross the street. Some cars were coming, so I had to run. Yeah. And as I'm running, I'm like, oh, I, like I like forgot how to run. <laughs> ah, you know? And it's because I never do. Right. It's a skill. Like, you know, back to training, um, I, you know, Olympic lifting, I find fascinating because- it's got to be the most studied and scientifically applied programming in strength sports, probably because it's been nations competing against nations for a long time. Mm-hmm. Did you ever look at the old Soviet era studies oh, that came out absolutely. with the, you know, I mean, a lot of them now everybody knows because iron curtain came down. Right, right. Any interesting things you read out of there that you've applied or is it just High frequency training? Yeah. That's I mean, the that's, biggest one. That's the big one. High frequency training and you know, like speed strength, like, the aspect of speed strength, so to catch up the audience, like you have absolute velocity, which mm-hmm. is sprinting and jumping, strength or speed strength, where you're lifting light weights really, really fast, strength speed, where you're lifting moderate weights very, very fast, and then relative strength or max strength, where you're just grinding through a squat or a mm-hmm. deadlift. So I like living more towards speed strength, mm. and I think it's going to create a better body, like I, even aesthetically. You know, mm. for instance, like I do lighter cleans, but I put so much more force into sure, the ground sure. and snatches as well that I'm like, oh, my upper back feels different now. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I was just trying to grind up a snatch, which you're like, oh, Jesus, like that's the last thing you should yeah. do. Like mm-hmm. I just jumped over that whole value of speed strength. But now like I have an upper back that can probably handle more strength speed weight, but at similar velocities. Interesting. Looking forward, do you see any, uh, do you have any predictions for any strength training trends that maybe isn't so widely utilized right now? Calisthenics. Really? I think calisthenics is going to make a big splash. So like, like closed chain movements. So like, uh, like, you know, like guys that do like the crazy, like rings Yeah. they do all the, like the bar pull-ups and all these different means, like the human flag. Yeah. I think there's going to be a trend towards that. Now That's why? what I, I'm fascinated with it personally. Now I could be biased because this is where I think the trend is going, but I think accessibility is going to be the new thing. Mm. And what I'm finding out, you know, look, look at COVID COVID shut down a bunch of gyms. Gyms are back open. Now you guys can speak more to this expertise than I can because I don't understand the general population as well. But I mean, you tell me, did home fitness grow tremendously? Oh yeah. yeah. Did your guys' programs go through the roof? Our like, home programs. You know, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, accessibility is going to be the new thing. And that's where it's like, what do I have access to more often? And if you're doing, for instance, microdosing, well, you don't want to go to the commercial gym three times a day. That's right. 
That's and a so very good point. I so, want more accessibility, and I think calisthenics can cover a lot of that. Yeah. So you don't think all the NBA teams are going to adopt tonal? Is that what's not going <laughs> Bro. I, okay, actually, I built a piece of equipment <laughs> to fight tonal. I, did right? you really? So I built... <laughs> oh, man. This is crazy, actually. Have you ever... Um, and you can go through my social. And I've seen your, I've seen what you yeah, built. Yeah. Saw that box. I yeah, yeah, that cool, thing's serious. It is. So I built sick. it because of professional sports. So the the craziest thing is, my first half season, I'm looking around and we travel to you know every city in America basically, and we're in these arenas and I'm like, we only have access to power blocks and a Swiss ball. These are the best athletes in the world, and mm -hmm. this is all they get access to. And of course, if we're microdosing, that's a big deal because. What all can I do with power blocks? Mm -hmm. You know, I can do a lot, but I mean, come on guys, like 82 games of power blocks. Like that's right. a lot mm -hmm. and it's not going to be enough load either. So I was like, what am I going to do? Also on that note, guys would miss you if they want to. So for instance, logistics is a big issue. So in other words, it's, let's say we're in the Midwest, at a very specific organization and they have their weight room on the other side of the arena mm -hmm. or we're in the north and they have their weight room basically on the third story so you have to go through fans to get to it that's mm -hmm. a big problem and mm -hmm. athletes are going to go no i'm not doing that and i agree with them there's a safety issue there i wouldn't do that either yeah. so when i think about that i go well where can they not miss me and i was like oh on the court mm. and i was like i want to set up the weight room on the baseline and they can't miss me there and so it started off with just a plyo box. Like I was like, okay, we'll do some, some plyometrics. We'll do some altitude drops. We'll do some concentric box jumps. And then it started growing. Okay, we'll have a med ball. We'll do some other things. Okay, well, I need more load. So I need a landmine. Like a landmine would be a good versatile use. Well, okay, I need that. Well, I'm really getting into this France Bosch stuff. So I want a ramp. Mm -hmm. And so after all that time, I was like, let's build something. And so I was able to partner with some people and we built this gym in a box. Oh, interesting. It's crazy, man. It's all these things fit inside the box and we roll that thing in and out, put it on the plane. Like it goes up the conveyor belt, oh, wow. comes off and it's crazy. So we set this thing up on the baseline. Guys run through it before their shooting uh, routine. So about two hours to an hour before the game, they go through their movement preparation. We call it our, our uh, tune up sessions. And some of them actually ask, like, it, it, there's some stress. Like, there's some high-velocity stuff. There's some high-level plyometrics. Mm. And then certain guys, actually, they experience a lot of load. And they go onto the court, go through their shooting routine. And so when you have 82 of those opportunities in a regular season, that's a lot of opportunities to get better. Wow. And so that's what I look at it as. I'm like, I'm trying to make a better athlete by the time we get to playoffs. So we talk about the strength response adaptation aspect, like get stronger as the season goes. Well, I don't only want that. I also want a better moving athlete going into the playoffs. Yeah. And so that's where you have 82 opportunities of that. And then post game, if we're on the road, we just set it up in the back and we're training. Oh, so great. Yeah, it's wild. Now, man. before we got on air, uh, you were sharing with us just like, I mean, just how litigious the NBA is and like what you can and can't say and all the stuff yeah. like that. So uh, I'm curious and you can say you can't say anything if you can't, but you know, I see something like, and I can say this, so I'm going to say it first and then you can, whatever you can. <laughs> you know, I see someone like LeBron James promote tonal. That was where the jab came from, right? I threw yeah, that jab yeah, yeah. at that, like, it promotes that. And I, this motherfucker is not using that. For, and if he is, his coach, his strength coach probably needs to get fired <laughs> for that. Are those, and, and so what does that put those coaches and then kind of be like, can they not comment on that? Can, they, can you even comment on that? Are they like, what's the deal? I'll, I'll say this. There's a lot of ways that, I want to comment on it. But <laughs> I will say I will say two things. One, uh, Mike Mencius, which is um, LeBron's guy, he's an amazing human being. He's probably one of my favorite people in the NBA. Mm. The dude's like he's been with him ever since he was like he started out. Oh, wow. but as a like as a human, I I love him to death. Um, and then second, I plead the fifth. <laughs> that's enough said for me right there you know what i'm saying but i would imagine like how how difficult that would have to be to navigate that because now you're messing with people's money right i mean that's, that's i mean well. he's he's heavily invested in that well, I mean, it's not that different than you know these athletes being you know um sponsored by candy and fast food and stuff Bingo. like that which i'm sure they have some here and there but you know no. at that level you're not gonna be eating 
I don't know, maybe you are, but I'm sure no, that's not right true. Here. I mean, you, I mean, they just remember the big old controversy with DK Metcalf came out because he talked about what he ate, like, and that was such there was all this controversy about him eating so shitty and stuff like that. Yeah. Did you guys see that? Marshawn yeah, Lynch Skittles, that. yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. it, go, it goes both ways, though. Uh, yeah. yeah, it goes both ways. Like, I mean, I feel like training is like the thing I, I think it's more about training that's a little more to me more controversial, and maybe that's just because I agree this yeah. is our space. No, no, and, I agree with you, yeah. I'm just yeah. like. Come on, dude. Because now what happens is like there's a, a a ton of kids that think that if I buy this piece of equipment and I use this, maybe I'll be bro. A it's it's shape. I mean all sport. I mean look at bodybuilders. You know I oh I'm massive because I take you know super. Oh yeah, Chuck super, Norris. Yeah, come on, like Chuck Norris really <laughs> yeah. with the you know like, it's the same thing. I forgot, right? I forgot about his. <laughs> what was he that crushed, thing he dude? He yeah, crushed dude, the that. total gym. Right? No, the what, total gym. Yeah, yeah. was it was it called the total gym? Uh -huh. You ever use what? one? I, I have. I have. It's actually it pretty interesting. Smooth. Actually, it's a yeah. Pilates it's machine at an incline. It is. Exactly what it is. Bro. Exactly what it is. The Pilates, the Pilates, Pilates it was machine. brilliant. Though. Number yeah. one. He number Can you look at Doug? How much did he make off that? How much did Chuck lot. Norris make off the total I mean, gym? I mean, yeah. he not crushed. as much as the uh, thigh master. Thigh the number master. one. You know, that's the number one selling piece of exercise equipment of all time. I hate my for a spring. Like, what am I doing? Exactly. I got out of that whole. I'm going to build something business. I know. What about resistance bands? I saw that out of favor. Totally in favor um you know strength athletes didn't use them and strength that power lifters use them bodybuilders starting to use them yeah what about with you guys you guys do you use resistance love, bands at all i love bands to create higher stressors okay i hate mini bands i think mm. mini bands should be what are mini bands those are the smaller rubber band oh. or bands that you put around your knees and you do your thigh master oh, exercises yeah. with and that is a plague in professional sports like you see you guys wrap that on like oh i feel my glute and you're like yeah, but there's not enough load to do that. Yeah. Like that's not creating any. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you touched the, that. The, the bikini on model workouts so, is long. Like, so bad. Like, I got see that stuff, and then of course you know athletes both in both sectors, college and professional sports. You see, like they like this is part of my routine, and I'm like, that sucks. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like, it's, I mean, you see, it, it, I saw yeah. it explode during my years of competing in the bodybuilding world. Uh, with bikini athletes, it became like every girl in the gym was squatting with bands yeah. around their knees. I thought Dude, this is so stupid. They're better off yeah, like putting bands on the it. bar and giving themselves resistance. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. And that's how I would use them. I use them in like powerlifting yes. scenarios. Yeah. Man, I love reverse bands. Yes. Oh my God. Do I reverse band athletes to the cows come Really? Home? Yeah. Because it gets them deep. Yes. Like sometimes they don't know they can go deep. I kid you not. There's guys that I've had in the past, and I won't say rather is in college or professional sports, but they can they put 315 on their back and they're like, ah, oh, now go quarter. And I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, dude, you're 250, like lean. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, and then you give them a reverse band and they're going 450 yeah. all the way to the bottom. Yep. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So now you, you, you've experienced this. Sometimes it's a neck up thing. You experience it. Well, let's take off that band. All right, now you're hitting 405. Like, yeah. word it's like a, that think, was the change i think it's like a neural like mm -hmm. it's like almost like your body has to learn the movement or you have to get the confidence well, i think it's a lot. safety it's it's your yeah. it's a uh governor yes yeah, it's a governor yes. in your it's brain because totally. i look at it and that's why i love altitude drops and for those who don't know what an altitude drop is you're standing on top of a plyo box and you literally just drop down mm -hmm. you stand on top of a box drop stick the landing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now get higher now get higher now get higher that you get to a point where you get high and you're like, ah, I don't know about this. But when we were growing up and we jumped over fences, oh yeah, yeah. right, we jumped off the second story of our house yeah. or off the roof of our house. Right. Like you can looking at those like uh, parkour parkour athletes, yeah. Yeah. how they absorb force. Now yeah. in a and they sport roll out performance, of it. heck yeah. yeah, this stuff's awesome. But in a sports performance aspect, if you land in a jumping movement. You're just reverse engineering a jump. Now that is a lot of eccentric load. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a great way to hide I didn't even jump. think oh, that yeah, you would. No, so smart. how far will you push that? Because, I mean, you think of a guy, a John Morant, who's flying through the air. I mean, that dude looks sometimes like he's six feet off the ground or whatever. And training him to be able to drop down from something that's pretty high, Do you? how high would you take somebody? I look at knee displacement. And so what knee displacement mm -hmm. is how much your knee bends. Okay. So And then here's where you get into the weeds how the, the the structure of the athlete. So you look at the guys that look like they barely bend their knees, but they fly through the air. They look like they're just so stiff, but they're bing, they're yeah. off the ground. Those guys create force differently than mm. say like, you've seen like the bodybuilder, like dude's jacked, but does the backflip. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He, Juju uh, Mufu. Yeah. He does. Comment. That's a or different Brent strategy. Cassidy. His strategy is muscularly driven. Mm. He's not stiff when he does it. So what he does is he uses a large full range of motion, deep squat 
into that backflip. High level athletes do that, but with a quarter of an inch bend in their knees. Mm. And that's the difference because it takes a longer time to create that same amount of force. Oh. That's what, you know, tendonous athletes, you watch <clears throat> knee displacement. So if they bend their knees a lot when they land, you're like, okay, that's a good thing. Like we want them to be able to do that. That's building strength for them. Since, since we're going to the weeds, um, yeah. d does that mean that shorter muscle belly, so in bodybuilding, you want long muscle bellies. You want right. short, tendon, short tendons, long muscle bellies. Does that mean in sports, short muscle bellies is more beneficial? I think so. I mean, that's what I've seen. Yeah. I mean, you've seen it before. Like yeah. we're long Achilles, small little calves up top. Boing. Like yeah. Those guys yeah. are freaks. So yeah. I just look at it like that. Okay. When now, now with the, back to the resistance bands or, or, or the, you know, one thing I noticed with those is I can add a lot of load with those. Does not hammer my body if I use an equal amount of load with just weights. Mm, yeah. is, is, do you think there's a different, it just feels that way to me. I mean, I can even use change, which is progressive resistance mm -hmm. or yeah, as I'm lifting the weight, but chain still hammer my body more than bands. Is bands are like continuous can, and I'm not sure. I think it's mechanical abrupt. tension. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So like chains, it's still load on the bar. Mm -hmm. It just deloads. With bands, it's so much of an exponential decrease in mechanical okay. tension at the bottom. Like if you got heavy bands up there, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's like up to 200 pounds yeah. at the bottom that's off. Yeah. So at the end of the day, when it comes to like how you feel, you got to look at it. It's got to be mechanical load. It has to be. I know, Adam, mm -hmm. I had, you you were doing them the other day on the incline because yeah. I had them set up. It just feels so different. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why. And that's why it's different than change is it's, it's, it's helping out a lot more when you're all the way at that bottom like yeah. that. So, so man, yeah. does it feel great? Yeah, man, no. It's ego, interesting. It's, as much as an ego, go lift it is i look at it like this but you still experience full range of motion yes and then when do you actually need to feel that kind of strength out of the bottom now is there a health perspective of doing a full range of motion squat without bands absolutely but when we're talking both ends of the spectrum on health and performance well why do you think powerlifters use it to begin with to yeah. overload the top well yeah. i also mm -hmm. think to your point about the the governors and that there, it being from the neck up like there's i remember it, and it was you know obviously these guys weren't smart enough to probably really know they were just trained to do this i lifted with these old this was in my early 20s and i couldn't even squat uh 225 or bench press 225 at this time I'm a real young skinny kid and they would get me under the squat bar with 315 but they just want it. They would say, "I just want you. Your body just, just needs to feel it. it. Yeah, unrack it. Yeah. Just feel it. Your body needs to feel that weight. It needs to feel that weight." And I'm like, "This is crazy. It's like 100 pounds more than I can even do. Why are we doing this?" They're right though. They were. They're and, right. And I remember. I totally remember that. Then I'd go throw something like 275, which seems so big for me. Then I could do it. You know, same thing with the bench press. We do the same thing. So there has to be something about that from the head up of just getting comfortable with holding that much weight and, you know, having the bands to kind of assist in that, in that situation, I think is, is massive. Right well, now take that to jumping. And that's the point of the altitude drop. When you get up high enough, you go, I don't know if I can land this. And that's the moment of, okay, this is where you need to be. Uh, and then let's add stiffness to that. Mm. So let's just say, you know, let's throw some numbers at it, like a 24 inch box. All right, 24 inch box is like, I don't know for whoever is trying this experiment. And then they do it and they're like, okay, I did it. Okay, now let's do it with purpose. You're not just surviving it. Okay, let's do it, but really absorb, like compress as much as you want, have a big knee displacement. So in other words, squat deep when you land it. Do you and have now, a cue? I have a cue for that. Yeah, it's a quiet feet, it. quiet feet, is quiet a, feet. I like that. Yeah, I yeah. like that a lot. Okay, so, steal that. Actually. Yeah, no, that's a quiet feet. I use feet. it for sprinting a lot, so that's fun. Yeah, I'm like, I, I try and when I used to tell clients, I'm like, try and make no noise. I like. Can that. you land and make no noise? I like it just that. registers I mean, for them, you know. But when they, but that is so muscularly driven. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, I'm telling you, you do high velocity eccentrics, you are just as sore as if you did like crazy oh, yeah. of volume bodybuilding. So when you're working through that full range, I'm just working at at a different velocity than I am with like a traditional lift. Now the aspect of getting more athletic. Okay. Now I want you to be on that 24 inch box. Same deal. Now do it with barely bending your knees. And then that's athleticism. Mm. The ones that can stick and stick like stiff. Now stiffness is health and performance all in one because the stiffness is what's training the tendons. Like I'm training for tendon and ligament strength mm -hmm. and development, but on, that's on the health side. But on the performance side, that be, that reactivity, that small knee displacement is what's going to allow me to create more force faster. Everyone can create a lot of force in professional sports. Who can create it the fastest? That's really what matters. That's what wins. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that I was thinking as you were talking about moving from higher to higher box and saying, ooh, can I do that? And then be like, ooh, I did that. Let me go to a higher one. 
there's, I think a lot of people forget this. There's feedback that goes to your CNS. That's also you being afraid yes. or you feeling confident. I mean, there's stories of athletes hitting PRs because they misloaded the bar. So they right. thought, oh, this is my, this oh, is almost yes. my max. Yeah. Yes. That's a true story. I think they're actually in the Olympics that happened where somebody actually hit a world record because they, and they thought the bar was loaded lighter than it actually was. So that's, there's that too. That's the best part about like Olympic lift or like a uh, colored bumpers. Hey, don't worry about what it is. And that's what I love about kilos. Don't, yeah. don't worry about <laughs> it. Yeah, no, no, no. It's red, blue, blue green. Kilos, yeah. No one cares. It's red, blue, green. Well, how much is that? Red, blue, green. Like, just, <laughs> just do how it. Much it is. We'll, I'll take care of the We'll weeks. calculate it later. And all of a sudden they smoke it and you're like, red, blue, green. Like, yeah. So that, to your point, yeah. Now apply that with sprinting. So how would you do that? Over speed training. So that means make them run faster than what they actually can. How? Well, how the hell did you do that? Great question. Tie them to a so car. No, no, you know you do? <laughs> you know, I mean, essentially, yes, <laughs> yes. But there's a device that allows you to do that. Uh, there's two companies. One's called 1080 Sprint and the other one's called Dynaspeed. But essentially what it is, it's, it's like tonal, believe it or not. It's electromagnetic resistance. But think of it as like a fishing rod. So like a spool. So right? it pulls you? It pulls you oh, that's towards hilarious. the device. Now you traditionally you're using it to go away from the device. It's like yes. a speed rocket, right? So like you're running away from it or like you're running with a sled behind you, you're running with chains right. behind Parachute you. Parachute or whatever. Right, so resistant sprinting. Well, with this particular device, now you can run towards it and it makes you run faster. So- And then you learn that. You learn, you self-organize. So now that you're self-organizing at faster velocities, you now- People can run. That. How many sense. athletes have eaten? Shit People can run that. so not many. Really, not many. Because what you do is you just rip the cord. Like if you if you're oh. really like that scared, or you change your strategy and you actually do. What's the name of this? Forces. I want Doug to Doug to pull it up. I want, I want to see. I want to see a visual video. example. Yeah, the what's best, it called? The there's Dyna Speed. I like how you said pull by your card. You were almost on point. I was like, this motherfucker's not gonna tell me right now. He pulls out. We're not gonna cut tie a chain. We're not gonna do this outside. Yeah, but we got to pull it with their car. So Lambo. Yeah, yeah. We gotta make this look awesome. But there's Dyna Speed. But I think 1080 Sprint. They actually have more videos. That's that so interesting. Do. I didn't even know a tool existed it, like this. It's really, really cool. No, yeah. so this makes perfect sense. Of course because, it makes yeah. sense, but like, it's, it but sounds I've done crazy. Everything from running in pools to I was working with the San Jose City like uh, track team, and they had like I mean everything was in that direction, that vein of like having a parachute behind. Yeah, you. Resist, right. resist, 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 resist. This is never assisting you to go about, about about this but direction. Ain't that reverse bands? Yes, yeah. it's the yeah. same concept. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. It's, you know what's funny is that oh, so it's a oh, it's way. Yeah, it's pulling them. So, so, so this makes sense, and I feel like this is the last frontier in training where, yes. bro, this is brilliant. It's uh -huh. it's about it's it's less about can I create more force and more strength, which we've known and we know a lot about that already. But this is more about can I teach the body to organize itself Bingo. in a better, more efficient way than it already is, and the way you do it is you assist. And, and you assist. put it in that position so it's forced to. We do it in weightlifting. Why Dude, don't we do it at so high velocity? This I makes can't believe I didn't even know this existed. Absolute but perfect that's, sense. But that's what we do with altitude drops. It's the same yes. idea. Yes. It's higher than what you could ever land. Corey, how long has this been around? Ooh, uh, good question. I have no idea. I mean, uh, how long have you known about it then? Have so you? I've known about it for five years, but I've only been in, in the position where I can afford it this past two years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's that. there's a difference. It's it's pretty expensive. Wow. wow. What yeah. Well, I mean, it may, how cool. It, well, yeah. I mean, can you separate the psychology from the physiology? I don't think so. It's the I think you it's can. all in the same. It's, it's all, all the same. In the same. And Absolutely. That's, that's another aspect that's like when we, like, especially when, like when you train to be this guy yeah. for so long, all that compression, compression, compression. Well, that goes into your psychology too. Mm, sure. And the thing that I've realized the most is when I got away from that, I'm like, be more elastic, reactive, be smooth, yeah. rhythmic, like be able to dance and be able to move. Like all of a sudden, like fast and loose, I'm like so much more relaxed. Oh, like wow. I don't have all this built up tension. Like I don't, I walk smoother. I, I don't get up and grunt. Like that's the thing that <laughs> I noticed when I said <laughs> that. I thought that's just because I'm getting older. Old <laughs> trait, right? I thought it was old, but that is tension. And it's like, yeah. how do you create tension? Wow. If I spend all my time yeah. creating tension like this, how do you think that? Yeah. Yeah. Next time you see us, we're all going to be all hell lean. Yeah. <laughs> we're all skinny. Hey. Mind yeah. pump Spider. is now mind yeah. lean. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, it's funny when you said make you run faster. I thought of, uh, do you remember the movie Kickboxer with John claude Van Damme? Where the, 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 the trainer it straps a piece of steak to his leg. He's like, what's that for? Make you run faster. Yeah, make you run faster. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the dog out. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> this will make run faster. This? How? Oh. <laughs> 
Well, I have you, so I have to. I want to ask more NBA questions just because yeah, yeah. I'm such a huge NBA fan. So, um, when you're watching, and, and I love hearing from your perspective because you have a trainer mind like ours. And I think that when I look at athletes, I uh, there's a there's a certain thing that I like even more. Like take their personality, even maybe the, how good of a shooter whatever they are. Like just I see when I see something crazy athlete. For example, I, I dropped John ja Morant. Like I just. When I watch that kid play, I'm like in awesome. Yeah, yeah specimen. just in awe of his, what he what he physically can do on the court. How one? How often does that happen to you? Where you're at, at is every game, or do you does your jaw drop? Uh, does it always happen when you see a certain player? Like, tell me like that your experience of seeing that, and like maybe even some names of people that like just blow your mind when you see him play. I'll say this: the I, I always get that every game, but I get it in different ways. Sometimes it's through raw athleticism and you're just like, oh my God, like how did, how's the body physical, physically capable of doing that? And then when you go to the skill side and you just see like, oh my God, people don't even understand how hard that floater was. Oh yeah. yeah. Like when you, cause when you're there and you see like how the play develops. Like flying to the side on like I the mean, like, you know, the play calling, <clears throat> like everyone knows what's about to happen and they still can't stop it. When you watch stuff like that, or when you're reading eyes, that's the greatest part about being so close. When you see like look offs and you see like they know the play, they know yeah. these guys are exchanging and they don't even have to watch. And all of a sudden that ball goes in that direction, hits them right in the chest. And you're just like, oh my God, like I can't even make that like mm, chest pass, <laughs> like directly looking at you yeah. eye to eye. And I can't even be that precise. And they're doing it over screens, like over their left shoulder, opposite hand or non-dominant hand. And you're just like, oh. So that's the thing that it's like, it's from a physical perspective. Absolutely. But the skills. Now, the skills are there certain see. guys that you see more of that from? Like when you're like, when you've played against certain teams or guys on your team and they're like, man, he's like, I mean, you got Chris Paul. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful passers to ever play the game. Like, he's I, special. Yeah. It, he, I look at it like this. The, the technical execution is probably the, the most fascinating thing you'll ever witness ever, especially from him. Yeah. Like, this, mm -hmm. The technical execution is just fascinating. Uh, people that really blow me away, I would have to say, man, would be a really good example. And any plays that you saw this year. So I, uh, I saved it because I don't, I don't want to lose. Obviously it'll be on freaking replays forever, but I think that chase down block that Ja Morant did this year. Mm. Where he grabbed the ball at the top of the square. At the top of the square is yeah. the most. Mm -hmm. And they, I watched a, someone put together a compilation of like all the blocks where someone's done that. LeBron's mm -hmm. done that, I think once or twice. The where it was really, I, I think his tops everybody. Yeah, the, the, the speed at which he came back to get him at his size to be able to at the height that he got. I mean, the, at the coordination you need to land that everything. When you watch it, it's it's. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I can't put it into words. Like that's the greatest part about being in it you get to see that night in and night out just in different manifestations. Yeah. Like that one's just through f raw physical athletics. And that's so cool to watch. <clears throat> I mean, guys that I look at and I go, Jesus, there's like Kawhi Leonard. When you see him, you're like, good God, that's a man. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. it's just some, my first year in the league, it was just looking at people like just physical domination. Oh, yeah. Like you just look at them and you're like, Oh my God, like I don't even know what like kind of human that is. Like they're, they're not human actually. They're just a different version of like a more advanced version mm -hmm. of humanity. Um, I think Kawhi is one of them. I mean, that's got to be to that point because he's a big dude, right? It's well, they're all big. Yeah, I, that's it. I remember my being a kid watching basketball both on TV and then never being able to sit like really low to getting older yeah. and more successful in my life and actually getting down. Yeah. Like, when you get down there and you actually get a chance to see like. Yeah, Holy shit. Like the smallest, the smallest guys right. make me look like a little oh, guy. Oh, for sure. And then to see what they're physically capable of doing is just like mind blowing. Just, just see them walking around. Kevin Durant, Durant just whatever he does. Yeah. Just yeah. anything yeah. Kevin Durant does is, is very special. Right, right. I have an interesting question. Uh, so they just now allowed in the college level to be able to get like sponsorships and all that. Oh, and like, yeah. I just thought that was so disruptive and obviously you're not in, in that setting anymore, but like, I just want to hear your opinion on it. And also like how you'd have thought you'd been able to like manage that in terms of like the, the players and athletes. I don't think I would have been able to manage it. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm removed from the early stages of it. If I ever revisit it, I hope it's like, a little bit more Ironed organized yeah. because right now it's the wild wild Chaos, west right? like it's unbelievable mm. and the money is ridiculous and the accountability is low mm. like that's the part that it's like 
it's a little iffy, mm -hmm. you know, like you can get all that money at one time. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like, unless they do like payment plans or however they do it, like you can do like, here's $500,000 done. And then, you know what? My ankles hurt. <laughs> there could be like, you know, they just be like, you know, I don't, ah, ah, you know, after this season, I'm going to go to West Virginia. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, what, what wow. just happened? So like, mm. I don't think there's enough policing in this one because they just don't, it's not organized yet. It's just a wild, wild west. You, I'm glad I'm not involved. Do you speculate mm. uh, that they're going to use this as a way to still pay college athletes without for like, yeah, like old it, ways of doing it? I mean, no, the old state. ways are just now, now legal. Right. That's so, all it is. That's what I mean. Like so the, it's like, basically, so do you think it just opened that door to basically yeah, legalize like, your like like USC a, got in trouble for? Like, you don't think. Because what's, the, what's to stop me? Like, let's say I was a, 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 a Duke alumni. Right. I'm, I'm loaded and I'm, I'm part of the inner circle of, you know, handing cash bags to players for decades already. I'm an old dude. I didn't get a picture of you doing it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a guy. That would do it now, sure. now, now this has opened the door. So what's to stop me from starting my, you know, own a uh, toothbrush line and I'm, I'm at my own brand. I have an LLC. I started up and really the only reason why I have it is so I can sponsor right. this right. I, I, shell company. They, like, for, but for real, like I think that's what you can do. And I think that's what's been done. Of course. I just don't, I, man, I'm I, just, cause I mean, if, if, if Nike can do it now, if any, like, yes. why can't I, that's you, where I think you're going to find like a lot of independent people come up. Yeah. And start their stuff. And it's going to be on, you know, the backs of, 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 of a uh, talent, you know, just like in any other industry. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just interesting how it's going to manifest. I just wonder, especially in the, in the college, like how the, the divisions are now happening. Like teams are leaving conferences yeah. Yeah. and it's now going to the highest bidder. So now I wonder what this shakeup is going to look like. It's basically professional sports, but it's more like semi-league yeah. for yeah. like the big 12s now humongous the big 10 and now the pac 12 is now dwindling down yeah. so i'm like is pac 12 now going to be like a mid-major and it's all about right, the tv deals and it's there's cool. so much money into it it's going to get really really interesting well it's you know hmm. uh sal and i listen to a podcast called the all-in podcast these these four billionaire dudes and one of the things they're talking about is they believe in the i think i don't think he said the two, next 20 years did he say like no big brands are going to exist anymore no yeah it's, 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 it's all, 20 it's yeah like, it's, it's the d democratization of media wow. he says if, if, if you want to sell something in the next 20 30 years you have to produce content. Yeah. Well, and, and that just the example of influencers like Kim Kardashian launching lines for sure. a billionaire and for sure. That one died, Mr. Beast Mr. did like Beast, a burger yeah. shop. Oh yeah. Right. Ten or twenty thousand people showed up and it's opening. I mean, it's it's, huge. that's I mean, it's what we do, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, it's the same deal. It's just you know, we're we're not it's decentralized. Well, yeah, no, it's <laughs> but it's really gonna disrupt the space as far as like brands and advertising. Cause I mean, imagine if you're and I made I use a stupid analogy of a toothbrush. But if uh, if I had that kind of pool and that kind of capital, what's to stop me from going and getting 40 of the biggest name college kids that are coming up and giving them the, some of the biggest contracts? And I could literally take a no-name toothbrush brand mm -hmm. and turn it into a, a like, yeah, household right. name out of, out of nowhere like that. I mean, if you got the capital, I mean, at the end of the day, do you have liquid cash? Like, right, right. If you got the capital, mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. You know, like I, it's all about what you want to get out there. And that's where sports has always been a leverage point for anything totally you yeah. know so now it's just college you can do it yeah. you know that's it's now i don't know how you protect brands now like for instance like let's look at an example like an ivy league school how do you protect like a mm. like a harvard yeah, you know right. and yeah, then all of a speech. sudden like one of your athletes is an only fans subscribe you know? <laughs> <laughs> like you know like i don't know like how does that yeah. work like yeah, oh, they're gonna have to like iron it out and yeah. i agree with you i think it's gonna it, we'll figure it out in the next 10 years or so 10 15 years i think it's gonna be yeah. it's yeah. gonna be super wild well, good yeah. deal, man. You're a great guest. Always a lot of fun. Oh, thanks. I, you I appreciate know, it. love picking your brain. Yeah, man. one of the things I like most about you is you're you're you're, you're really good at the the science of uh, of just adaptation and strength training in particular. And you and you explain it very well. So, really appreciate having you on the show oh, and absolutely learning pleasure, from man. you. Well, I really I really think of uh, you guys as like our the three horsemen yeah. in, in sports. You're, you're like our guru. You, yeah, you sure. I think you, uh, Smarzo, and uh, Fabrits are I think three of the best in my opinion. Uh, in the space that are putting out information related to sports training. And I think that it's been 
behind for a long time. And yeah. and I remember coming across all your guys' content. I know Justin introduced us to you first, but and then ironically, you guys were all friends. Yeah. So that's what's kind yeah. of funny. It's like <laughs> we found you guys individually and then find out everybody's all connected. And of course yeah, Max Loki interned for me for like two weeks. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no shit. You gotta hold yeah. that over forever. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> just remember. Just remember, dude. Just remember where you were. <laughs> Good stuff, brother. Good, Good man. stuff. Thanks Good for coming you, on. Hey, thank yeah. you, gentlemen. Appreciate, Appreciate y'all. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out, and less injuries.